Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, November 19th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not investment advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay. So I had a few people send me messages or emails or comments about commenting on this FTX thing or this situation with this crypto blow up thing. I mean, all I'm going to say is, is reiterate what I've said in the past, which is um, during the previous bull market, I don't even call it a bull market, uh, feeding frenzy, whatever it was around crypto when all this money was coming in, uh, did I dabble in it? Yeah. I wanted to understand how it worked. I, you know, bought and trade, you know, exchanged it, tried to figure out the mechanism. So I at least have some education on it. Did I make a little bit of money? Yes. Did I did do some small scale um, mining? Yes. But it was nothing significant in my portfolio. It was not, not that big of a deal. And if you remember, I never really talked much about it. If you recall, the impetus for starting this channel was one of the, uh, during the previous up cycle, whenever it was several years ago, when Bitcoin hit 20,000, it was right around this time in the holiday season, uh, when I called, you know, called the top on that. And that was one of my first videos, which if you go back and look at the beginning of my videos was a horrible quality and everything like that. But suffice to say, that's what kind of started this channel. Whenever that was five years ago, 2017, whenever that was. And I never really could get my arms wrapped around it because, you know, as I became older and wiser, as like I've talked about many times in this channel, when it comes around to investing and speculating, I mean, if I really can't wrap my arms around it, um, I'm not really going to get involved with it. Kind of like um, Buffett talks about the circle of competence. I really couldn't figure out what was going on. What it struck me as was no different than Beanie Babies, any other bubble I've seen, baseball cards. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that some more here and some of the lessons that come out of this. I don't really know enough about what happened here. What I see is I just chuckle because this just has all the hallmarks of just a big delusional uh, feeding frenzy, greed, bubblicious environment. And when you start reading some of the articles about some of the cast of characters that were running this whole thing, Polly Morris relationships, I mean, these people were flat out weirdos. And then I watched a couple of videos with interviews of like the CEO, this uh, kid, whatever his name is, Sam Fried, and the CFO, I think, or the CEO of this Almeida, this really strange looking weird girl. Uh, and then some of the stuff that was posted that she posted online. I mean, these were just flat out weirdos. These were flat out, you know, and, and people, legitimate investment people were giving these people hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, Tom Brady and his wife uh, invested a lot of their money in this. Um, many large hedge funds uh, now were wrapped up in a potential scandal of a money laundering situation. And this is what a lot of other famous people were, or investors were saying. This is just a big scam. Uh, this whole crypto thing is a big scam. Uh, and, you know, stay away from it. And so did I dabble in it? Yes. Did I make a little bit of money on it? Yeah, it wasn't life changing. I, I, I just got away from it. I just couldn't wrap my arms around it. And it just smelled bad. Okay. And so I backed away from it a couple of years ago as, as viewers on this note. And I, and, and I don't talk about it much because all it does, all it did was I tried to warn people. I said, stay away from this. It's probably not a good idea to get involved in this. It's not going to change the world. Uh, like they're saying, we've heard all these things before. I mean, it was, again, it's a lot of young people, right? That don't have a lot of knowledge of the history of markets that don't, uh, haven't been through these bubblicious times before, because as I'm going to go through in this slide, nothing ever really changes. And so if you have wisdom, if you've been through bubblicious periods in the past, then you kind of understand what you were looking at. And if you're nimble, yes, you can cream off a little bit during a bubble, but it doesn't really pay to invest yourself emotionally and financially in these things. And that's what a lot of people did, right? Now, am I going to sit here and say, 
there's going to be some wag that gets on here. Yeah. But what about this guy or what about that guy? They made, you know, all this money. Yes. There's people that made life changing wealth on this. Okay. But again, that happens in every bubble, but the majority of people that are involved, they don't do that, but yet they get sucked in by that shiny object visions of sugar plums. We've talked about this before, uh, not just with, when it comes to, uh, to, um, cryptocurrencies, but anything bubblicious. Basically, what you had was a period of time, 10 or 10 years or so, of basically interest rates at 5,000 year lows, which created an environment of an over a cornucopia, an overflow, a fire hose of liquidity. So every goofy project, every dumb idea, anything that should, you know, it, it, you know, got funded and then a get rich quick mentality which is always there inside humans especially inexperienced people uh or investors i don't want to call them investors speculators whatever you want to call them people uh they get involved and then it it, it, it kind of feeds on itself it's a flywheel effect right it draws more money in you know you see it with the kathy woods arc funds you know she's still out there talking about you know changing the world with technology her funds down whatever 60 70 percent and, you know, money's running away from these things. You don't see the laser eyes anymore on certain people on Twitter. You know, it used to have that. Uh, that's gone. So uh, I just want to go over a few things to remind people that when you see these, this is a learning experiment. This is, if you're going to stay in the investment markets, and a lot of people are going to get soured now in investing or they get wiped out. Um, I've talked about this before in my journey, how I got wiped out early. You should take this as a learning opportunity. And now it's time to reset and level set and do things the right way. And the way you do things the right way is that you, you know, you recognize things for what they are, not what you want them to be. You try to take the emotion out. You don't get sucked in to the latest fad. Okay. You stay inside your circle of competence. Um, if you don't know anything about a subject, if you can't explain it, if it's just because it's going up, I'm buying it, then you probably need to reconsider that. So here's a few few things. And like I said, I'm sure if people are going to take some shots in the comments, do what you want. I'm doing fine. My, 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 my uh, portfolio is beating the S&P. Uh, I feel very comfortable with what I'm at. And I didn't, you know, lose all of my, all of my wealth in, in cryptocurrencies. And, uh, you know, being, getting involved in the, this, what looks like it might be one of the biggest financial scandals uh, you know, in, in a generation, at least with all kinds of undertones of money laundering and kickbacks where, you know, now we have you know, one last allegation that I have to get in there is this another allegation that, you know, money was given to from the US to Ukraine to support the, uh, the Ukrainians, you know, economically and militarily to fight the Russian incursion. And the Zelensky regime was taking the money and putting it with this FTX outfit. And then that money was being used by this Sam Fried to, you know, grease the wheels of politics, not just Democrats. That gets reported a lot by the alt-right or whatever, or a lot of the conservative Twitter sphere. They were giving money to all politicians because it's a uniparty. And so if, you know, I just, I don't have time to even get into it. I don't, there's people that know a lot more about it than I do. I don't really have time for it. I find it amusing. I chuckle, could have told you that something like this was going to happen. Um, and here we are. This is what always happens at the end of a bubblicious period. So anyways, here's Charlie Munger, who everybody likes to make fun of. And he, during this whole thing, when he was, you know, basically they would ask him his comments on crypto and he didn't have anything good to say about it in a typical Charlie Munger way. And people made fun of him. But again, he's proved to be right. I mean, he's 90 something years, 50, over 50 years of experience and seeing all types of markets. This was nothing new for him. So what did he see? Here's a quote from Charlie. Uh, recent quotes when he was asked about it. You are seeing a lot of delusion, partly fraud and partly delusion. That's a bad combination. He goes on to say, good ideas carried to wretched excess become bad ideas. Nobody's going to say, I got some shit that I want to sell you. They say it's blockchain. And then we go back and use, uh, you know, some of Warren Buffett's, um, uh, what Warren Buffett said, you know, about these bubble periods. Only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. Again, you don't see the crypto eyes anymore. You know, people like this pomp guy on Twitter. Uh, he doesn't have the, the, the laser eyes anymore. 
so a lot of these people are being, you know, exposed. They were riding the wave. Do I begrudge them? You know, they were riding the wave. They created a persona. They created a business around this. They were appealing to the mob. But if you want to be successful in these markets, if you want to be successful in life, you have to separate yourself from what everybody else is doing. This is one of the main things I like talking about on it. It's not just re with respect to investing and speculating or financial matters. It's life in general. Look, you know, what do you want to be? One of a million or one in a million? Okay, you have to separate yourself. This is where the constant education process, the respect and learning of history, of listening to people that have more experience than you. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about other people like Munger or Warren. These guys were chastised. They're still billionaires. Uh, Sam Fried's not a billionaire. And, you know, if he's lucky, if he doesn't go to jail, he's lucky if some mo Russian mafia guys don't find him or somebody else that he rooked out of a bunch of money and, you know, machine gun him, you know, so, or he's going to get baseball batted or something. So, I mean, I wouldn't want to be that guy for any, any amount of money in the world. And so this is what I have to chuckle about, you know, this have fun staying poor. This is what the, a lot of the crypto bros said during when you would bring when anybody that was trying to be rational about this or questioned that this was possibly a bubble. Look, I have nothing against blockchain technology. I think it has possible uses for things. But this whole crypto thing was nothing but an excessive specula speculation frenzy enabled by lack of regulation and um, you know, historically low interest rates that persisted for a long time. That's what it was. And so I don't see people saying that anymore. This is what people would say, you know, especially 20 somethings that don't have a lot of experience that were riding high, they were smelling their own farts. And, you know, this is what you get. Have fun staying poor. Okay. Well, hope it works out for you, bro. Um, like I said, there's going to be people out there that made money on this. You're not probably even going to hear about them because, you know, they, the guys that were able to make money and keep it are not the kind of people that are going to be out flexing right now. But I want to remind you of one thing, the wisdom of Solomon. <clears throat> this is Ecclesiastes 1.9. You should be familiar with this. Uh, not pushing a religious agenda, just telling you some wisdom uh, from a particular uh, writer. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. And I have used this uh, verse many times on this channel. Uh, I think that if you can understand this, if you can process this, then you will understand um, that there is nothing new under the sun, that the reason why we have these repeating cycles of bubbles and crashes and periods of excess is because human nature itself does not change throughout history. It remains the same, okay? Uh, the emotions of fear, greed, uh, how that plays into investing and speculating. These do not change throughout history and time, okay? And the lure or desire for easily obtained wealth is a very, you know, dangerous hypnotic uh, that, 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 that influences many people in these episodes. So I've suggested books. There's all kinds of books about previous crashes and uh booms and busts, uh, you know, this is why I tell people you should read and you should educate yourself. Then it's easy to recognize these things. I didn't need to know anything about crypto except for the fact that in a period where we had social media, a lot of young investors in excess of liquidity, uh, that this was going to be the ultimate outcome because it, it had all the hallmarks of a bubble. You have a bunch of people that don't know anything. I mean, I think it was one of the things I talked about is, you know, if you're walking down the street and you find, you know, well, they used to make thousand dollar bills and $10,000 bills. They don't make them anymore. But let's say, you know, back in the day, you found a thousand dollar bill or say you found an ounce of gold sitting in the gut, uh, curb, you know, in the street and you pick it up. Okay. Well, you just, you know, found $1,700. Does that make you a good investor? That's all this was for most people. Okay. They weren't developing new technologies. The average person thing was going up. So, you know, the chart was going from the lower left to the upper right. So they got in. It's nothing new. It's happened many, many times in the past. And so I'm not here to dunk on people. A lot of people uh, lost everything. They lost their life savings. People that 
shouldn't have been involved. You know, they made common mistakes that people make in bubbles and they got rug pulled severely. And so what I find interesting is, is um, if you look at the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum, they really haven't dropped too much. Um, yes, we've dropped from the highs, recent highs, but it's kind of curious to me. So I don't really know what's going on. I don't want to comment on that. But uh, when you have news like this, but like I said, uh, when you, the more you look into this and read about it, it's, you know, I, I just don't have the time to really get it, it, it. I find it amusing and that's about it. And I read a few articles about some of the wacko weirdo stuff. And then like, I just saw like the interviews, a couple of clips of interviews, just how these people presented themselves and acted and talked. I wouldn't give them, uh, I wouldn't even want to be in the same room with them. I would, and I certainly wouldn't give them millions and millions of dollars, but this is what happens in a, in a bubble. And so this reverence for people that seem to know what they're doing this is why I keep telling people, most people don't know what they're doing, even when they have prestigious degrees and they've went to Harvard and all these other places. That doesn't give them uh, the ability to not fall into this hypnotic, bubblish estates. It happens all the time throughout history. And so, again, nothing new under the sun. Here are some various bubbles. You can see the percentages and it's the same pattern. What goes up in a rocket ship comes down. When it runs out of fuel, a bubble eventually busts in gold or tech or the Nikkei, China, housing bubble, Bitcoin, FANG stocks, ARC, biotech. It, it, these are just other episodes. This is a chart from uh, Bank of America. Nothing new under the sun. And so there will be other bubbles. You know, more than likely oil and gas and, you know, energy will enter a bubble at some point in the future as it you know as it gets recognized that we're in an energy crisis and you know we have a limited means to you know that will enter a bubble going from undervaluation to um fully valued to overvaluation again this is not going to be immune we we had the same thing happen they don't show it here but we had a bubble in a lot of material stocks and energy stock energy companies back here i was just a teenager then but i remember that and i've talked about it in the past so nothing new this is nothing new this is like the most egregious example but there's nothing new under the sun uh, we will continue to have because like i said human nature um just rinse and repeat it doesn't change and of course when you have low low interest rates and excess liquidity like we had then this is what happens. And like I said, the emotions of greed and fear take over, fear of missing out. Uh, and then it attracts all kinds of charlatans and people with, you know, less than optimum morals and how these people were given hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, you know, with people that, like I said, that are brand name uh, investors is beyond me, but it is what it is. So I wanted to comment on that. Again, if you want to take a shot at me in the comments, go ahead. I, I, I don't propose to be an expert on what's happening or what did happen, but I think you will recall that I caution most people to probably stay away from this stuff. And I hope you did. And I hope you uh, didn't get uh, caught up in this. So here we go. Uh, here's another, you know, fanciful idea that, uh, again, you know, to quote Soros, one of the things that we try to do here is identify the premise that is incorrect, right? And the premise that is incorrect currently is that you're going to replace the internal combustion engine vehicles. Well, the market's not going to do it. I'm not saying it wouldn't happen by government decree, at least in the West, with electric vehicles. And here's why. Electric vehicle makers burning cash slammed by high sky high costs. Every time Lucid, this is an article, again, again, pinned the article or articles placed links to them in the show notes if you choose to go look at them so that you can read them and determine for your own self if I'm reporting correctly. Sometimes I don't, you guys put me in check or I have a, I've read it in a skewed view and other people bring up other points that I may have missed. So I, I, I do encourage that. Every time Lucid Group or Rivian Automotive sells an electric car, they are losing hundreds of thousands of dollars due to staggering raw material and production costs, their latest earnings statement showed. Quarterly reports from electric vehicle makers from the past two weeks show them struggling to hit delivery targets and rapidly burning through cash. 
Lucid's cost of revenue surged to $492 million in the July-September quarter from $3.3 million a year earlier, and its losses widened as customers canceled orders, fearing long wait times. Many EV startups recorded huge losses in the September quarter and warned that high costs were here to stay due to surging inflation and a global supply chain crisis. Just a year earlier, several listed their stocks at heady valuations, lured by the success of Tesla, now the world's most valuable automaker. So we shall see what what, what will happen. Um, Again, I think a lot of the perceived success of a lot of this was, you know, we, I get emails and messages from people, oh, you don't understand, costs are coming down, technology is getting better. Look, when you talk about batteries, it's not like a microchip. The mistake, I've talked about this before, the mistake that many people make is think that um, semiconductor laws of physics like Moore's law apply to chemistry uh, and batteries. And so a lot of the reason why um, EVs and various other rebuildable technologies were going down over time is not because necessarily there was technological advancements, uh, production scale, scaling production, but that only gets you so much. And so I think what, what, it, what really was a big factor and uh, many other authors or speakers have talked about this was that raw material costs were, you know, you were in a 10 year bear market for copper and nickel and all these things. And now that's ending. And so now if you've already rung all the manufacturing and productivity costs out, and if your raw materials are going up in price, then, you know, this is going to affect your cost of goods sold. So um, again, uh, there's various technologies always being worked on. And again, you will see somebody that's a true believer or somebody that's really an advocate for this in the comments, they will say, yeah, but John, at the University of Yokohama, they're working on this new technology or MIT has this, they made this in the lab and it's so much more efficient. Again, that's great. I fully believe in the ascent of man and technological advancement. However, getting things from the lab, I would be an interesting, you know, getting things from the lab to engineering and being able to scale it in production at a cost that's reasonable, that's a big chasm and gap. And I think it would be interesting to have like a graduate student or somebody do the research of all of the, you know, go through like all of the um, technology, Scientific American or the MIT uh, magazine that comes out, Technology Magazine, and all the headlines or cover stories about all the new technologies that were going to change the world or whatever, and then see how many of them actually were brought forward into products that actually did change things. So I think you would find that the majority of the time, uh, there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of what works in the lab doesn't necessarily scale to uh, a product that's change, literally changing the world. It's just not how things work. You can make things work in the lab all the time, but then when you try to scale it, it's just not possible for various reasons. I don't think that you're going to have ice internal combustion engines be supplemented by, supplement, supplanted by uh, electric vehicles anytime soon. Will they continue to go up? Yes, in the West, because they're being subsidized. The government wants it. And so if you put laws into effect, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in some of these states like California, where they've banned, you know, you have the legislature and the governor Newsom, who wants to be president, going to ban internal combustion engines or diesel trucks in the state by whatever, 2030. But the guy's not going to be the governor then, so he doesn't care. There's no downside for doing that. It's going to be somebody else's problem to deal with when nobody can drive around the state because there's not enough, you know, or you're going to force the cost of ICEs up. So saying and doing things so that you can get some political clout or virtue signal or whatever advantage you're trying to get as you're trying to create a narrative so that you can run for president or whatever you're trying to do doesn't necessarily It's not, you know, if it's not economically viable, it won't happen, but it won't be your problem. This is the problem with politicizing energy and all these things, because the people that are making these decisions and the people that are politicizing it will have to pay no personal economic or professional uh, 
price for it. You know, back in ancient times, if you said you were a prophet or said, you know, you know, if your prophecies didn't come true or your predictions didn't come true, you were stoned. I'm not suggesting that's what we should do. What I'm suggesting is, is that these people pay no price whatsoever. So what? They get voted out of office. People become angry enough. So what? They, they, they've they creamed off. They've done what they needed to do personally. So I suggest that, you know, maybe I could be wrong. I don't see anything on the horizon showing that I'm going to be wrong. There's, we're going to, we, we are, going down this path for whatever reason and uh it's going to cost a lot of money and i don't really think it's going to work and it's going to you know i don't really care about the wealthy and the policymakers in washington dc i was just in washington dc the last few days and i was driving taking an uber to the airport to go to reagan national and as you go leave dc to go cross these bridges i don't know the exact way but you look over i think it's arlington and you see the bigger buildings that they've built over there and one of the main signs this is how big the grift is and how blatant they are but it's this uh raytheon technologies on this big gleaming you know i don't know it looks like about a 20-story building and i'm thinking to myself does raytheon who makes you know all these missiles and defense products do they have a plant here do they build anything and what no they're there because that's where the money is that's the imperial city of the hegemon right so uh, you know, I just don't think that the average person out in the hinterland, the person that's just trying to survive, the person that's just a working class person, they're never going to be have it, all this stuff. And they're the ones that are going to suffer as we go down this path that lobbyists and political characters have created for us because they want to get wealth. They want more wealth and more power. And that's what ends up happening. Regular people become poor because of it. They suffer because of it. And, um, People in Washington, D.C. seem to be doing fine. Everything's booming there. Uh, traffic, uh, construction cranes on all the surrounding little cities around there that I could see where I saw, like, like you would see in an emerging market. I probably counted a half dozen at least or 10 cranes, uh, you know, tower cranes building high rises. So I guess things are going pretty good there in the Imperial City where they make all these goofy laws and mandates that, you know, they're not going, you know, Joe Biden is probably going to be dead if he does run again, he won't make it through his second term. He is obviously advancing into dementia. Lifespan is not that long. And he's not going to pay any personal price for any of this. You have this new Congress in there with a few people, barely have a majority. It's going to be a lot of, you know, again, a lot of smelling of their people smelling their own farts and making noise and hand waving and sending out, uh, you know, mailers to people to get money to agitate the boobus to send them money because they're going to take on, you know, the, the, the Dems or when the Dems are in power, they're going to take on Trump or whatever. And, you know, in the meantime, uh, people that just want to live their life are affected by these policies. And so this is really part of the problem, right? Um, we're not seeing the copper supply. This is, you know, a talking about what the potential needs of copper will be, uh, but, you know, but what we have is a long-term supply gap remains unsolved with widening deficits. And we're just not seeing the announcements or the required investment to find and bring on the new copper supply that's needed to do this. I mean, again, I, before I got on this video, I just took a quick look at some of the base metal prices, copper 369 a pound. And we're probably heading for, you know, a hard landing here in the U.S. So you would expect to see some of these metal prices be a lot lower. But again, you know, we don't have necessarily the demand issue. It's going to be more of that supply issue, right? We just don't have the materials because of the chronic decade plus long underinvestment. And this is what's going to end up happening. This is why you're not, this really plays into this high cost. This is what's going to happen. I mean, we all know, we've talked about it ad nauseum, the, you know, copper requirements for, EVs and for rebuildable technology. So here's an article was in Reuters, I think, uh, or uh, put a link to it, but uh, they say why oil will hit $120 a barrel soon and stay high for the next two years. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about oil a little bit. It kind of dropped massively the last uh, week. I got hit pretty hard, um, you know, and you see 
people were like kind of shocked. They're like, well, uh, we had draws, EIA draws, and the SPR is coming to an end. Why would oil be dropping? So this is what happens, right? I mean, in the short term, anything can happen. Um, people unwinding positions, people shifting out of oil trade into the tech bounce we're having, all kinds of things that I can't even explain. So this is what you see in the financial media on CNBC, clown shows like that, clown shows like Bloomberg, because they have to constantly be talking you know, during the market day and whenever they're on talking about why, why, why. Nothing has fundamentally changed. This is the same thing I used to say during you know, when we were the initially invested in uranium. Nothing's fundamentally changed in the mid to long term for the oil trade or for the energy crisis that we're in. Okay. Can, you know, is this the first whiffs of a, a deflationary episode as the US economy is heading for a hard landing? Very possibly. Could oil drop to 60 or 50? Very possibly. I don't know. Um, but I'm fully convinced in my long term position. What, one thing I'm really convinced about is the ability of the companies that I'm invested in, they're not in danger of dying now. That was the danger with all the debt. I mean, we've had such, most of the companies that we are invested in or speculating in, they really have cleaned up their balance sheets. Um, the focus, there's not been unadulterated growth, just grow for the sake of growing production, spending money on acquisitions. It's all been about paying down debt and now transitioning into shareholder returns. Um, and because we'll, we'll talk, we've talked about that before, why that is. So even if, you know, some of these, even if the price of oil drops from here, which, you know, it could, uh, you know, we're, we're heading, I think, in the U.S. for a hard landing. It should be obvious with the Federal Reserve now you know, compounding their previous mistake of keeping rates too long, low and raising them too quickly. Uh, they're going to get caught off sides again. So anything can happen. Right. But we still have these other things going on with like this article talks about. Right. Europe's ban on Russian oil will begin in December and it could make an already tight energy market worse. Uh, we'll see because, you know, the the tankers that were coming from the Baltic ports to Europe were a couple days trip. Now they're going to have to source this oil from somewhere else. Uh, now the Russians are going to have to find someplace else to send the oil that they were previously sending to Europe. So again, more disruption of the efficient uh, supply trade routes that were created over the last several decades are now being interrupted because of politics. So we don't know what the full effect is. Okay. Uh, more on this article here, global crude prices are set to climb as demand isn't going down, but supplies are dwindling. And so we see, we see continued global draws, com com continued draws in the U S um, and, you know, unless you have like a GFC event or that uh, shutdown, like we had during the pandemic, uh, demand for crude oil continues to grow uh, by, like I said, one to one and a half percent a year around the world. So we will see. I mean, even we've showed that chart before where even like over the last 50 or 60 years, there's only been like a half dozen episodes where demand for oil, the growth in demand was, you know, went down. And, uh, regardless, it goes up over time because why, as we've said before, as people become more wealthy and economic activity picks up and especially these emerging markets with these people entering their S curves of demand and wealth creation, energy demand picks up. It says the abrupt drop off in deliveries from Europe's biggest energy supplier will likely cause a price spike for crude and prices will face renewed pressure in February when the EU next set of sanctions on refined products like diesel kicks in. The one thing that no one's really talked about that's really done very well, we've talked about on this channel, uh, is tankers. I mean, they're really benefiting from, like I said, when you take the political situation of the sanctions where things were optimized for the shortest distances or you were transporting these products via pipeline and you've now politically just waved a wand and said, we're not going to do that anymore because we're mad at, you know, Russia. That's fine. Like I said before, whether that's the right thing to do morally, I'm not going to get into that. What I am going to say is there's consequences for that. And the consequences are that you have to still source the same amount of energy from another supplier. And that supplier is further away. And yet you cannot just snap your fingers and increase the tanker fleet. That takes years. And so now you've created more ton miles of travel and on a stagnant tanker fleet 
And so that's why you're seeing tanker rates explode. And the same things happened with um, products. Uh, you have all across, if you look at, you know, the, if you look at the results that have been put out by the various uh, tanker companies, whether they're crude carriers or the product tankers, I mean, they're all doing superb. So I anticipate that will continue as we, you know, crystallize and, uh, you know, lock in these, 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 uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, bans on crude and refined products. Uh, then we go on to the final bullet point here, separate from Europe, sanctions on Russia, China's reopening plans and U.S. reactions to OPEC plus decisions can either keep oil prices muted or push them dramatically higher in 2023. Uh, I don't think OPEC is opposed to further cutting rates. We have an OPEC meeting coming up, I think the first week of December, we'll see what they do there. But I don't, I think if prices continue down, they will, you know, they don't have spare capacity anyway. So I don't think it you know, them cutting back production further to maintain prices is what I think they've said that, you know, they're open to doing. So we'll see. Um, like I said, I don't predict things. I can't predict things in the short term. It's impossible. I can't give you a reason why things drop. People talked about, well, expiring front month contracts and then blah, 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 blah. Paper, you know, trading of oil affects this. And this. I don't know. All I know is, is that there's been insufficient investment for a decade for a resource that enables civilization, that enables the lives of 8 billion people. Okay. And so until that's rectified, we're going to have, um, you know, higher prices for a longer period of time because the market is telling the price mechanism in the market is telling producers to produce more oil. And yet you have government inserting itself, telling them not to do that. So, um, I don't see, you know, in the short term, anything can happen. I've said there's going to be volatility. Uh, what I what I suggest is that, um, you know, if you take a mid to long term perspective, I think you'll do well. Now, it's easy for me to say this because I entered these trades. This is this is the trap that don't fall into this trap now. Buying these things now, I'm talking about oil companies and the things that I talk about is harder now because the price has already advanced substantially. I've got stocks up in the portfolio. Uh, you know, I was telling people to buy oil field services stocks over a year ago, maybe 18 months ago, when nobody talked about it, no one cared about it. A lot of these stocks are up over 100%, some of them up 200%. So your, your ability to enjoy those same returns are, are not the same. Those stocks may not go up 200% again, okay? And it makes it more difficult to be successful in the trade because the price that you pay and you buy things in an extreme undervaluation, a lot of the asymmetry has, has been enjoyed. Okay. That doesn't say that it's not going to continue, but the, the task becomes harder now. That's all I'm suggesting. But I do say that if you understand and, and it, the thesis of the fact that these oil cycles, investment cycles are multi-year, can be up to a decade long. And uh, if you also buy into the view that oil and gas is not going away in the next decade that, you know, they're, we're going to eventually uh, have to go out and drill more for more oil. So uh, there you go. And, you know, while we talk about China starting, restarting, reopening and fits and starts, it's going to have to reopen. Um, I know that the recent cases there for the disease that cannot be mentioned are exploding like in Beijing, but they have to move. I mean, unless they know something we don't know about this, then, you know, I think one of the things they're trying to do is develop their own vaccine internally, which I, I've heard is very close to happening. I think that may be a catalyst to reopen. They, they've they invested so much politically and prestige-wise, uh, Xi Jinping and some of these other people in the Communist Party, that they can't just turn on a dime now because it, they don't want to lose face. They don't want to say that we did all this, affected your life this way, caused all this issues with the economy, um, and then just reverse it on a dime. So they have to have a way to slowly open over time and explain it in such a way that they don't lose face or they don't, you know, lose the the confidence of the people. Or that's how they perceive it. So I think this is going to happen in fits and starts, but. 
you know, that's 2 million barrels a day, two and a half million barrels a day of demand that's offline. So we'll see uh, how that goes in China, but I don't think you can just stay locked down every time a bunch of people get the sniffles in Beijing or wherever. Um, so we'll see, maybe I'm wrong, but, uh, what I find interesting in India, you don't even hear about, you know, anything about this, uh, uh, pandemic stuff and petroleum demand there is increasing. So it says here in the article, uh, Petroleum demand in the world's third largest oil consumer has been growing faster than anywhere else in 2022, rising by more than 400,000 barrels a day. That's equivalent to more than 20% of the total global increase. The country's vigorous appetite for oil was clear early in the year, but what's impressive is that it has remained robust in recent months, just as consumption growth slowed elsewhere. And so, yeah, I mean, I think the Indian economy has grown at 5 6%, something like this. It's 1.4 billion people. Uh, this is going to be one of the fastest growing places that's going to be substantial growth for oil over the next several years. Uh, again, as you need oil to, uh, as people get wealthier, you need energy inputs. So uh, this is why you're seeing oil demand go up. And it's not just here. There's going to be all these other places we've talked about before. Uh, and so I don't see oil demand going down. Now, you could see a situation because in the West, we're on that we're self-immolating ourselves with respect to energy, uh, committing ritual seppuku in this drive to electrify everything in the next you know couple of years or whatever they're trying to do. Uh, you could see a situation where as we force our oil demand down and our standard of living down uh, by government fiat, by government dictate, the the demand that disappears here in the West will just increase this will be sucked up by these countries. That, that's all that will happen. So you could be in a situation where you maybe you don't need to grow production that much, but you still have decline, right? You still have that, that little gremlin of six to 7% decline rates on hundred million barrels a day. That's six to 7 million barrels of new production you have to bring on every year. Okay. That's if demand doesn't even grow. And we know that demand grows at one to one and a half percent a year. So you see where this is going. And so, when we have basically large economic blocks, major economic blocks like the United States and the EU doing everything they can to politically strangle the oil industry of hydrocarbon industry in their countries, then, you know, that's just going to delay, delay the, the, the new money coming in and cause uh, higher prices for, for longer. And so here's a chart about, uh, you know, are we at peak shale? Um, there was, this is a Rybar, Rystad Energy projections that they've made at different times. You know, at, back in August, they said that they were projecting, you know, over, you know, growth in lower 48, uh, lower 48 state, excluding Gulf of Mexico oil production outlook. And then you see that in October, they brought it in. And in November at the recent, uh, they've brought it down some more. So that's over a, a million barrels a day that they've lowered the, uh, their forecast for um, new production. So we'll see, right? Uh, um, with the current political environment, with the exception, I think, you know, there's a lot of independent people out there still trying to, that are doing a lot of drilling, but we, we, we've talked about this before, like the bigger companies, Pioneer and Oxy and all these people, they're still going to grow production, but not like they did in the past, okay? Because like it, we, we've talked about, it's, you know, debt reduction and return of capital. So the Biden war with hydrocarbons continues. Biden feud with big oil ratchets, ratchets up just as world needs more U.S. oil. CEO of um, ET, who is that? I can't remember who that is. Anyways, said this week that U.S. energy policy is so all over the map that it's becoming, quote, like a Saturday night live skit. Goes on to say in the quote, it'd be funny if it wasn't so tragically sad, unquote. And so, you know, we've talked about this in the past. I'm not going to, I'm not going to bag on them uh, anymore. I mean, this is the policy. This is what they said they would do. This is what they're trying to do. They're trying to strangle fossil fuels. Remember, look in my eyes, kiddo. I don't know how many times I have to say it. He said it. OK, and they're doing it and people endorse that view in this last election through their voting. So this apparently is what Bubis wants. They want, you know, less hydrocarbon energy. 
more rebuildables and higher prices. That's what they're going to get. Uh, until this sinks in, until the pain becomes high enough, because I don't think people ex have extrapolated or understand yet. I mean, I was shocked by the results, I have to, I have to admit. Um, now, there's, I'm not going to get into why that happened and all. There's a whole bunch of theories around that. But I, you know, if you want more and higher energy prices, that's what you voted for in this last election. You're going to get it. The policies are not going to change for the next two years at least. We go on here, part two, you know, but the, so out of an article it says, but the very next working day, the oil industry was blindsided. This is talking about uh, recent meetings they've had with President Biden. At a hastily arranged press conference on October 31st, President Joe Biden castigated big oil for handing, quote, outrageous profits to shareholders and executives rather than bringing down prices at the pump. Unless that changed, he warned oil companies faced more taxes, quote, their profits are a windfall of war, the windfall from the brutal conflict that's ravaging Ukraine and hurting tens of millions of people around the globe, unquote. Well, that's interesting. That's not actually accurate, but you know, the, uh, you know, but that's what he says. And he, he has the bully pulpit and he can say whatever he wants and he'll be covered uh, by the media. And that's what they'll put out, but that's not actually true. But regardless, this gives you, you know, in, in the same, same thing, he'll have administration officials or himself say that we should drill more, we should produce more, but who's going to do that? It's irrational. It's mixed messaging. Okay. It was just the kind of whiplash that has repeatedly sown mistrust and stoked tensions with the fossil fuel industry over the course of the Biden administration. According to multiple interviews with executives and lobbyists involved in oil and gas who declined to be identified because the meetings and conversation, conversations they described were private. Well, we already know. I mean, they, 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 they castigate them out of one side of their mouth and then, you know, in, tell them that unless you do this, we're going to, and then you have crazy talk. We're going to nationalize the industry. Well, that would be perfect. That, that work, cause that's worked out in so many other places. Um, the bottom line is, is that the people that are advocating for this energy transition are trying to force it down people's throat. If they had a legitimate policy and tried to do it over decades, uh, it would probably be more likely to work and be accepted. If they're trying to do it is shove it down everybody's throat and make it happen in one elect electoral cycle. And you can't do that. It doesn't work like that. We know that from previous energy transitions. And so this is why you get this mi mix. This is why you're going to have a disaster. Okay. Eventually this is going to culminate in a price spike and a culmination of the energy crisis leading to, you know, probably all time highs in the oil price at some point. And then this people will be thrown out and then, you know, a new administration would come in that would say, okay, we have to have a rush. This is what you would hope would happen. I'm not predicting this is going to happen. And then we need to have a rational policy. We're going to sit down. This is what we're going to do because we got to get this done. Okay. And, uh, but then it would still take years after that to bring production back and get things scaled up. This is not something you just, as we said before, this is why, these cycles are so imperative to understand because they're so long term and they're such long cycles. You can't, even if they wanted to, even if Biden changed his mind today and went out there and got the trust back of the industry, and to, you can't just snap your fingers. It's not like that. And so here we go with the coal plants now. So this is uh, Mr. Biden again. This is uh, something that was echoed during the uh, Obama administration. We kind of look at this current administration as the third Obama administration. But uh, here we go, another article. President Biden said Friday that all of the country's coal plants should be closed because they're too costly to operate and can't be relied upon as a dependable energy source for future generations. Quote, wind and solar will replace them, he said. Here he said, uh, I was in Massachusetts about a month ago on the site of the largest old coal plant in America. Guess what? It costs them too much money. They can't count. No one is building new coal plants because they can't rely on it even if they have all the coal guaranteed for the rest of the existence of the plant. Well, the reason why you can't build new coal plants and you're not, and you're shutting them down is not because they're inefficient, not because they are not reliable. They're quite reliable. Um, they're more, they, they have a higher, uh, you know, 
they stay online and produce more energy than any re re rebuildable plant. The problem is, is that the government policies and regulations are regulating them out of business. This is not the same as what's happening around the rest of the world. This is what I continue to tell people. And so this is another example of the, you know, war on hydrocarbons and the inability. I mean, if you understood what really goes on on the backside of a coal fired boiler, you would understand, you know, very, it's almost minuscule anymore. The emissions that go out of it that are actually harmful. I'm talking about sulfur dioxide. I'm talking about things like that, right? Mercury. They're almost like when you're dealing with like these state regulators, which I've had to do is what they call best available technology. I mean, sometimes they put in, they would, they would want the level so low that there's not even existing technology to measure it. So you have these best, you'd be sitting there talking to this regulator and they'd be like, well, you need to, you know, we're changing the, so this is all, you know, we're changing the, the legislation and the rules. When we'd say we can't even measure that low. Well, you just have to use the best available technology. So it's not like in the night, it's not like Victorian England where everything is just spewing into the atmosphere. This is all about CO2 again. And I'm not going to have that conversation. I, CO2 is not a pollutant. It's a life-giving gas. Uh, the more of it, the better, as far as I'm concerned. So, but like I said, you can use, when you're, when you have political power, you can force things politically that aren't necessarily economic or in the best interest of everyone. And as I've said before, you know, the adult person understands that there's trade-offs in life and in, in the world. And part of the trade-off is if you want to have a lot of the things that we enjoy that we don't give a lot of thought of, like on-demand electricity, you know, ubiquitous heating and cooling, uh, relatively cheap, uh, you know, energy sources, then you have to make trade-offs on other things. Um, if you want to get rid of all this stuff and try to do everything, you know, uh, the way that they're discussing with intermittent power sources, you're going to create yourselves more costs and um, more problems. But I'm not going to, like we said, we don't make the rules. Heads we win, tails we win more. Um, this will take years to fix after this, we hit the wall. So, you know, I'm not a macroeconomist, economist, but I like to talk about these things because I find it fascinating what's happening. Uh, on some of these stats around the economy. Uh, and I think some of the opportunities, if you do have cash that are going to reveal themselves uh, when we hit bottom on some of this stuff. And I talk about like, you know, real estate. I'm not a big real estate investor, but like I said, if things become cheap enough, I'll become interested in them. And we're heading for this massive crash, I think in real estate, because, you know, as long as, these rates aren't even really that high historically where we're at right now. And yet look what we see here, the weakest home buying conditions on record. Uh, soaring mortgage rates have sent US housing market into a tailspin. So we have the index of buying conditions related to interest rates at some of the lowest levels of all time. This is the percent, I think share saying bad time to buy a house. This is a record, it's like 83% of the people surveyed say this is the worst time this is a bad time to buy a house so if they're 83 percent of the people are saying i guess they were surveyed that maybe they were in the market but i don't know the context of this i just like i said take this for what it is a grain of salt but if you're in the market to buy a house and 83 percent of the people that are saying that are saying it's a bad time then i don't think a lot of houses are going to get sold uh what's going to change it is if prices need to come down because that was another bubble that was created, bubblicious conditions that were created, fake wealth that was created because you had a decade of basically zero interest rates. You had, you know, I locked, like I've told the story, I've locked in the mortgage on my house that I own down in the Valley, you know, at 3% VA loan. I didn't have to put any money down. Why wouldn't I? So now with inflation running at seven or 8%, I mean, it's a negative, uh, I'm getting paid to have the mortgage basically, if you want to look at it that way. So, um, why would I sell that house and go buy another house now and have to pay 7%? So what will happen is, is that prices will continue to decrease uh, and, and people, sellers that are forced sellers, you have to understand how it works in a real estate market. I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but say you have a neighborhood and you have, you know, all the houses there are anywhere from like, let's just say 350 to, you know, three, 375, 400,000, depending on the size of the house or where it sits in the neighborhood. 
and somebody dies or somebody gets cancer and they have to sell because they can't make the mortgage payments and they get into a distressed selling situation. And if the co comparison sales in that neighborhood were, you know, three, 380, 400 recently, and this person has to sell for 325, then the comp resets to that. And everybody else is affected by it, especially in this high interest in a market that's weak. That's what ends up happening. That happens on the upside too. As you get in a situation like we just even saw maybe six months or a year ago, where you would see these stories of people putting their house on the market for, you know, 400,000, uh, they would have, you know, 20 bids, uh, people, you know, cash bids, people just sight unseen bidding, outbidding each other. That happens on the upside too. That resets all of the comparisons for everybody else in the neighborhood that's contemplating selling their house. So what works on the upside works on the downside. Um, it moves quicker, I think, on the upside because of the bubblicious conditions, but you're starting to see the ice crack. The ice is cracking, definitely. Uh, like I said, I, one of my hobbies is, is looking just in the neighborhoods that I live around here uh, and seeing the price cuts on Zillow. And like I said, going to some of the open houses and you're the only person there on a Sunday afternoon at two o'clock. Uh, the realtor has a very distressed look on their face. <laughs> so this is what we're seeing. And uh, houses are not selling. And the, the people are, you can see, are going through the stages of grief. Well, it'll turn around. It's temporary. I've seen this before. It's temporary. It's still a good time to buy. Yeah, it's always a good time to buy a house as long as you get your commission. I mean, I don't say that, but that's, you know, the mentality. At some point, it will be a good time. It'll be an excellent time to buy this. And, you know, people will step in and buy them. Probably more of these corporate uh uh, entities that were buying houses. So something, the thing to note about this is that housing is such a large part of the economy. So if this isn't working, this is just another, you know, seized up piston in the engine of economic uh, conditions in the country. So I just wanted to point this out because I find these things very, uh, how much more can, can the economy take right before people say we're in a recession? And so this is uh, another from uh, Crestcat Capital. They put a lot of good charts together. You can always recognize the charts because so we have this black background, whatever color on the graph, but buying conditions for houses, University of Michigan index. You're down at, you know, lower than 80, 81, 82 recession levels, right? I remember that. That was a very bad time in the country when Volcker was raising rates to crush inflation and the economy basically got jammed. You've seen something similar now or worse. I mean, how much low, can this thing go even lower? Yeah, I guess it can eventually go to zero. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how this is measured, but this is, uh, you see how quickly it's dropped off, right? And this is way worse than even the financial crisis, guys. Look at this. This is the real estate bubble, if you will, in 2000, you know, you know, 2005 to 2008. It's not even that. We, we've well exceeded that. We're down to like Volcker Est. And this is when rates were raised to 20% or 18%, whatever, 15%, I can't remember, double digits to crush inflation. And we only have rates at what, four, four, four and a half percent, something like this. And they're talking about, you know, people, you see what's already happening. And so uh, here's car gurus, use car index. Uh, you just see for the last few months, you see how it's a 52 week low. It's basically in a tailspin. Um, no one's buying cars. No one's buying big ticket items because I think people get a sense of what's happening. Rates are too high and people, when they go in to buy a car, most people have very little money to put down, if any. And so they try to do a sign and drive and then their payments are $1,000 a month, like we talked about before. And people are not going to be able to buy cars. Plus the fact that the used car prices were inflated due to the supply chain issues. And so that's fixing itself. And this is, like I said, used car prices are a, 4%, I believe, of CPI. So you're seeing, you're going to see inflation coming down. It's peaked, it's coming down. Uh, are we going to have whiffs of deflation? Absolutely. Is it going to lead to um, the Federal Reserve pausing? I think you're going to be shocked about how fast it comes down because I think the economy is really coming apart at the seams now or beginning to. All right, that's it for this week, guys. Uh, again, um, hope you got something out of this appreciate the kind of stagnated on our growth. Um, hey, it is what it is. We still have a pretty good audience here. And I appreciate the folks that have uh, contribute in the comments, people that have been subscribers to the newsletter. 
And I hope we bring you value. We try to, you know, go outside the bounds of normal thinking or, or I don't want to say normal, but uh, consensus. We try to stay away from consensus thinking here and come to you with a contrarian view. And so one other announcement I want to make is I'm going to bring back the uh, alternative channel on Rumble. I'll post these videos on Rumble also. People have asked, but I'm going to go back to making the uh, old man screaming at the moon and telling the kids to get off his lawn videos that a lot of people enjoyed. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I just needed a break from it for a while, but I'm going to, I'm going to bring it back and it, use it as a medium to explain some other things that really can't be discussed on this particular forum on YouTube uh, because they simply won't allow it. All right, guys, uh, look forward to that. And again, appreciate it. Uh, I've got Thanksgiving coming up next week. So I wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving with your families. I hope that you will take some downtime and reflect on being thankful for the things, you know, things we talk a lot about negative things on here, but I remain positive uh, longer term for, uh, you know, it's that's the mindset you have to have, right, in my view. So please enjoy your time off and your, and your Thanksgiving with your families uh, from me to you. All right, that's it for this week, guys. We'll talk to you next week.